And so we've been looking at uh, this topic, this kind of having these conversations about silence over the last couple of months. And we started kind of a, we shifted and pivoted last week to say, hey, how does silence play out in what we know is the Christmas story? And so we looked last week, we kind of kicked it off being the first week of December, and we looked at the silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so there were about 400 years of, of silence. And we, we found that God uh, always has a purpose in pausing. That's kind of what we looked at the last week. Now we're going to see this week that God has a purpose in penalty. God sometimes has a purpose in punishment. And we do begin with John the Baptist because John the Baptist is woven into the Christmas story. Um, Elizabeth, and uh, who was John the Baptist's mom, and, uh, and Mary, they were cousins. And so when you look at the story, nothing happens in, on God's watch that just is just uh, coincidence. Uh, I, and I actually sometimes, you know, play on words and kind of freak people out. I'm like, I believe, I totally believe in coincidence. That's C-O dash incident. There's a co-incident. When we have our incidents, they, it's with God. I know that's exciting. Yeah, I can tell you, like, just totally blown away by the brilliance of that. We begin today, and we're going to park in Luke chapter 1, where we see kind of the backdrop of John the Baptist. And we're going to look at his father, Zechariah, today. So we find in John, or Luke chapter 1, verse 5, in the time of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. And his wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. All those details are important. We're not going to get to them today. We could, but we, we're going to, it's just, it's not just circumstance. It's not happenstance, I should say. Both of them were upright anchors as we looked last week. When there's a pause, God is looking for anchors, for those who are steady, that are not, not blown back and forth by the wind, that not that don't get miffed off so easily, and just they're all here and there. They're anchors. If you remember in the book of Genesis, God looked for a man that was an anchor. He found Noah. He was an upright man. He's looking for someone. Upright doesn't mean perfect. It means that you are looking upright. <laughs> in other words, you're living your life in such a way that you are connected. You're solid. You're an anchor with God. Both of them were upright in the sight of God. That means Elizabeth and Zechariah observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. They had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they both were well along in years. It might remind you of the Abraham-Sarah story, right? So here's an older couple and they have, they have no children. That's the backdrop. There is a, there, he's in the, a, they're in the, a certain lineage and uh, Zechariah is a priest. Okay, we want everybody to, to, to uh, stay tuned. Here comes the encounter. Like many encounters in the Christmas story, an angel arrives and we'll, we know by the story that this is the angel Gabriel. This is not Gabriel's uh, premiere here. Gabriel showed up in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. So we know that angels have much of a, uh, more of a lifespan than human beings. They're scan, they span over, they are endless, infinite beings. And so we see him in the book of Daniel, Gabriel, and we see him now here with Zechariah. We continue in Luke chapter 1, verse 8. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, they, they had kind of a rotating uh, schedule, and he was serving as priest before God. Watch this. He was chosen by lot. In other words, they said, hey, we're going to kind of pick, like we would say, the lottery, you know, for a school or something like that we're going to pick. And again, we could look at that and like, wow, lucky dog. He just got picked that day. Nope, that's not how God works. God maneuvers in these circumstances. And we're going to see how important that is coming up. He was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Now, that's just one of the duties that they had uh, 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 that represented kind of prayer for the priest. Verse 10, And when the time for the burning of the incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. This was a praying church, so to speak, a praying gathered of people because God was about to do something. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah standing 
at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. Have, do you notice a pattern there? Like the shepherds out abiding in the fields and the angels came up and lo, they were freaked out. That's, uh, that's the original Greek. They were, uh, they, were, they were as we would, by the way, right? Let's say you're in your walk-in closet and all of a sudden an angel is standing right there. You're like, you know, you'd be gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, the same thing the angel said to the shepherds, don't be afraid because here comes heaven. There's that theme again. Don't be afraid because something great is about to happen. Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Watch. Your prayer has been heard. What prayer? Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son. In other words, they must have been praying for a long time to have a child. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son. And you are to give him the name John, which was an unusual name for the way they named people back then. And, and so when you look at this, you think, oh, they must have been waiting and, and just asking God. And I wonder, I just wonder, at one point, if they got to a certain age, they just maybe they gave up. But you see, God doesn't give up when we give up. I don't know what time, uh, you know, uh, at what year they said, you know, I don't know if it's going to happen. And God said, I haven't forgotten you. There are times when we're asking God, we're asking God, we're asking God for something. And God said, don't give up. I'm not done yet. And so their, their prayer was answered. Then Zechariah in verse 18 asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? A question that anybody would ask, especially at that age. How is this going to happen? It doesn't make sense. Watch this. He's a wise man. This Zechariah, he says, I am old and my wife is, well, well along in years. <laughs> Men learn, look and learn. Notice he didn't say, hey, I'm well along in years and my wife is old. You, 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 see, you got the proper order there, right? When you look at this question, you have to say, well, you know, Abraham asked the same question. Wait a minute. I'm well, I'm, I'm an old guy. How can this be? Sarah actually heard, overheard the conversation between the Lord and Abraham, and she laughed. When God told, communicated to Mary, you're going to have a, a baby, even though you've not had a relationship with another man, a man at all, and you're going to have a baby. She kind of said, hey, all right, can you kind of break this down for me? It doesn't make sense according to my biology class in the seventh grade. You know, how does this all work out? So when you look at all of those that ask questions, it feels odd to us what happens next. The angel answered and said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I've been sent to speak to you and tell you this really, really great news. And now you will be silent. And you will not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at the proper time. So I'm when I'm reading this just as a normal, regular old guy, human being, I'm like, that doesn't seem quite fair, does it? How come Abraham wasn't silenced? How come Sarah, she, it seems worse than this, she started laughing at the whole thing. How come she wasn't silenced? How come Mary wasn't silenced when they all questioned something that's miraculous? And here's what I would say to you, and the, inf the very uh, finite, I almost said infinite, the finite knowledge and, uh, that my brain can handle. As I read the scripture, what I find is that God's discipline is customized to each of us because only he can read the heart and know what we need. Let me give you some examples. When the rich man came to Jesus, he said, sell everything you got. He doesn't say that to all of us, but he knew this man's heart was gripped. There are many people that have great wealth that helped that advanced the kingdom of God. That was true in Paul's day, Jesus's day. There are people that have used their means to advance the kingdom. God has blessed them. They use it. But this rich guy 
See, he didn't know how to do that, and he was gripped with greed. Zacchaeus cheated people. When he came out of the house with Jesus, he said, I'm going to make things right. I'm going to pay people half back what I've cheated them. I'm going to give them a great interest on what I cheated them. See, that was customized to him. When Martha was, was kind of uh, scolded a little bit by Jesus, girl, you're overloaded. You could have microwaved something and you did the whole Martha Stewart thing. You didn't have to go that route. We could have done a potluck because, see, I'm in your house and you've ignored me because you've been in the kitchen. See, that was customized toward her. In other words, God is God, and he can always be God, and we can never question him, but there's something that Zechariah needed that day, and it was silence. It was int- he, he needed some thoughts, but I think there's some bigger picture things that are happening here. Here's the thing that I want to propose to you today, because I think it's, this is where it's like, okay, we're, a lot of history, and like, I can't even keep up with the characters and all that. I get that. But here's where I think it's important for you and me as we walk this Christian life. Because otherwise, watch, if you don't get this, you'll be sour towards God. You'll be sour towards God. I know it. I've had sour chapters in my life. Perhaps God's punishment is actually a present. Perhaps God's Christmas punishment here is a Christmas present. That the penalty is a gift. That the discipline is actually something that you that everybody needs. Here's why I say that. When we look in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and don't resent his rebuke. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. The Bible is very clear. If you have a child and you're not willing to discipline, you're not loving that child as that child needs. Now, if anybody in the room has more than one child, you'll know that you cannot cookie cutter discipline. It is very, very different. I have two sons, very disciplined, very different discipline through the years. One's 18, one's 19. These are, so, you know, we're getting past the, the, all those years of, of needing to, to do that. But in those growing up years, there were, there, there was a totally different way of discipline. And that was customized to what each son needed. In the same way, God says, I need to. Talk to, I need to speak to Zechariah and say, you're going to be silenced, and the discipline that he has for him is something bigger. In addition to that, God is always bigger than the circumstances. We know that. But more than that, specifically today, God is always doing something bigger than the circumstances. I want to repeat that. God is always doing something. He's about something. In our culture, in the American culture, the downside that we have is that it's all about me, right? We can get no onions at Burger King. We can, you know, uh, extra cream at Starbucks. We can get it just the way we want. So therefore, after all that conditioning every day, we think, oh, this is happening because for me, I that's a no. It's all about the kingdom work. So if God disciplines us at at times, what he's trying to say is, I'm at work up here. You're in the micro story. I'm in the macro story. And I want to do something great for the kingdom. Could we benefit from it? Sure. But when you read the old guys from the 1800s, and they were called coffin missionaries, where they packed their coffin because they knew they weren't coming back. Listen, it was not about them. When their kids were dropping dead on the mission field, it was not about them. It wasn't about how they felt. It wasn't about how they were getting upset or getting you know, ticked off or getting offended or all that. They were there for the kingdom. And I think we have to learn from that. And so I want to throw out some, some kind of macro things today. And there's, there's something that's absolutely fascinating. This is like the surprise ending do I have your attention? <laughs> here's the thing. Here's a few things. God's promises are always bigger than our responses. God's promises are always bigger than our responses. Here's what I mean. When someone guarantees you something, in the human experience, that guarantee 
is not always a guarantee. I'd like to say it's a guarantee, but sometimes there's fine lines. There's this, that, and the other. So, you know, I ordered something on Amazon and it never arrived. And I, I canceled the agreement because it never arrived and said, hey, you can cancel. Because I waited like 30 days and the thing never showed up. So I canceled it. They sent me an email. They said, hey, congratulations, you've canceled your order. The problem was I didn't get my money back. <laughs> if you didn't get your money back, contact the seller. So I contacted the seller. This is not my $22 shoes. I know you're wondering that for some of you. <laughs> I got the shoes and I'm going to wear them and I'm going to show you and you'll be ashamed that you didn't get them. <laughs> so, no. I contacted the seller. You know what the seller said? You got to contact Amazon. I contacted Amazon. They said, you know what? You got to contact the seller. I contacted the seller. They said, you got to come. You know, so I lose because the agreement was broken, even though it's in writing. Even though it's clickable, you can click here, cancel, and you, you click here and you get your money back. But we're used to that in life. So sometimes we superimpose that, that God gives a promise, but our response was less than stellar, and we think he must have canceled the promise. But what we find is God not only will not cancel a promise, he cannot cancel a promise. That's where it gets exciting. Watch this. Let's review the message. Verse 19, and now from the angel, you will be silent, Zechariah, Zechariah, and not able to speak until the day this happens. You see, the disciplines, you can't, you can't say anything. You can't even yell at a football game on Sunday afternoon for nine months. Zero. Gonna, nothing. Can't say anything. You can't sing happy birthday, jingle bells, joy to the world. Nothing. I mean, what a lousy Christmas. But there's a purpose. There's a promise here. And he said, look. Even though your response was one of disobedience and I could see what was in your heart that you doubted me, my promise is going to, because he could have said, you know what, let's cancel it. Forget the baby. I know you've been praying all your life. And your response was not great. Because sometimes in life we can think, man, I really blew it with God. He must be canceling something because we live in a cancel culture, don't we? People want to cancel you just, just like that so easily. And he said, I'm not going to cancel. You won't be able to sp speak until the day this happens because you did not be believe my words, which will come true at the proper time. At the end of the book of Joshua, who had gone through you know what and back, through that wilderness with a bunch of gripey, cranky people, and then fought after he got, fought many battles once he got. He was a warrior. At the end of his life, this is what he says, the last words of Joshua. He says, now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. That means he's going to die. He knows he's going to die. He said, you know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Not one single one. Every promise has been fulfilled, not one has failed. Why is that? This is a big one, okay? This is like, you know, it's a shocker when people hear God doesn't love, God is love. Big difference. Water just doesn't make you wet. Water is wet. That means water cannot not be wet. So you stick your hand in water, it's going to be wet. Anybody ever stuck their hand in a bucket of water and you pulled it out and it wasn't wet? Okay, you can't stick your hand into God and not pull it out with love. God is love. That's bigger than God loves. Are you, are you tracking? All right. God is faithful because he cannot not be faithful. So when we're like, I wonder if God has broken his promise. He can't. Watch. 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, if we blow it in the response, he remains faithful. Because he cannot be unfaithful. God, it's not even in, it, it doesn't do that, right? It does it, it cannot not, God cannot not be faithful because just because he is love, he is also faithful. He is true. There's not an ounce, an inch, a whisper of anything unfaithful in God. Don't ever doubt the promises of God. Heaven is on its way. We sang it this morning. When things look dismal, and your news channel has saturated your brain. Think, God, is God coming back at all? God promised 
He's coming back. Here's the second principle. God's grace is bigger than our failures. Thank you, God. Watch this. In Luke chapter 1, verse 23, when the time of, of service was completed, that means that after this unbelieving response from Zechariah, God said, you're going to complete your service. You see, Moses was a murderer, but he completed a service. David was a murderer and adulterer, and he completed his service. Gideon didn't believe God. He completed his service. When, when his time of service was completed, Zechariah then went home, and then they had the baby. What do I mean by that? It's stunning to me. It's stunning. It's always been stunning to me that when you read the Bible, when Moses said, I don't want to do this, if I'm God, I'm like, okay, not a big deal. I'll pick somebody else. When Gideon was a chicken, like, hey, I, I called you to warfare. You couldn't even face off with your dad. If you know the story, he went at night and did all this. Fine, I'll get somebody else. I got a lot of other people. When I've blown it, I'm shocked that God hasn't booted me out. But his grace is bigger than my failure. Because we have, I spent an hour and a half yesterday with someone in a different country that had an emotional breakdown going to a, an American university. And the, and the breakdown became because the failure to respond to God and the beating up of self to the point this person couldn't get out of bed. They went into a depression because there was such a self-mobbing, a self-brutalizing. And, and we have a way sometimes of internalizing those things. And we forget that God's grace is bigger than our biggest failure. Whatever that failure is, David plotted to murder a really good man to sleep with his wife, and God still didn't take him out. Was there some penalty? Sure. There was some discipline? Sure, because God loved him, but he didn't take him out. Stunning to me. I mean, honest to goodness, who wouldn't have taken Peter out after the 17th time he stuck his foot in his mouth? I mean, we're getting, we're getting near the end. He saw, how many times did Jesus say, love one another, love your enemies, all this, sermon on the mount, here come the soldiers, whip out the sword, you know, he's to cut the guy's ear off, like, you must have, Jesus must have like, ah, oh, for the, <laughs> what is wrong with you? Unbelievable. And maybe to the top of the list was Jonah. What a rebel. What a Steve. Jonah 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. That's our God. You cannot read the Bible and know that God's grace is bigger than your biggest failure. Here's the final one. <laughs> Good for us. God's purposes are above everything. His purposes are above everything. I had a leak during Hurricane Ian. And uh, I called Eric. Uh, anything happens, I call Eric. Uh, yeah. Uh, my son's car was overheating on the highway yesterday. I call Eric. <laughs> I know where the key goes. That's my knowledge of cars. So I called Eric and uh, talking through, okay, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? So anyway, Hurricane E and I go out and I look uh, up at my garage ceiling and I, the whole like deal is like water, you know, dripping. There's a million drips coming through my drywall. And uh, I, I, so I, I call him and he goes, oh, let me come over. He came over during the hurricane. See why I call Eric. Uh, I'm going to put his number on the screen in case you guys want to call him doing anything. <laughs> 
And he said, hey, man, you got to poke a hole in your drywall and let that water out. And so I did. I poked a hole and uh, poked it through the wrong one. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not that stupid. But I, I poked it, you know, and the water, boy, it just came out and probably saved the, you know, the whole thing from collapsing. And so, you know, I got to fix the roof and this, that, and the other and had a guy. And I'm just like, oh, geez. And kind of came out and, he, and they looked at it, saw a friend in a, in a, a, a jewelry store. He goes, hey, pardon me, I got to take a call. I'm a roofer. I'm like, Sorry, did you say you're a roofer? Help help me through the thing, insurance, all that jazz. And the guy came out and said, hey, let me look at your roof. He went up there and goes, man, you've got so many broken tiles up here. The hurricane just did a number on your roof. They're those clay tile things. And uh, he said, hey, let me, here's, uh, let me call the insurance company for you. He called the insurance company. The insurance company came out. And uh, he said, man, if this is this kind of tile by a company who went out of business 10 years ago, we're going to have to replace your whole roof. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's that's awesome. <laughs> Is it too late to take the kids' Christmas presents back? Yeah, just kidding, because I know how to cancel on Amazon now, by the way. <laughs> he said, well, it's only going to be your deductible in a category hurricane. They can't raise your rates, so actually you're getting a whole new roof for it. I'm like... That's what I'm talking about. That may be the best deal I've ever had in my life. Do I have a tear running down my face? Sometimes in the worst kind of scenario, maybe you're going through a divorce. Maybe you've just lost a loved one. Maybe you just got a bad health report. Maybe you, you, something is going on in your life at work. Maybe you've lost your job. You're going to lose your job. I mean, there are a million things that happen to us in life. And sometimes we think it's about the, uh, us, right? So this guy comes from the insurance company, and I see his bracelet that said, I believe in Jesus. And we had the most incredible conversation. And I don't know where that conversation is going, but it's not about my leak. It's not about my insurance. It's not about my roof. It's not about my grief over how much I'm going to pay. It's not about any of that. God said, those things are going to burn up. It's about the kingdom movement, about the kingdom movement, always. So when we have, when we're disciplined or things are not going our way, we're not going to blame God. We're not going to question God's promise. They're going to come true. We're not going to question God's grace because it's bigger than whatever is happening. And I promise you that whatever is happening in your life, and there's not a, we're all humans, so we all got human junk happening all around us like a radar, you know, this beeping all around us. And there's stuff happening, and God is working. He wants to do something bigger. So what happens here is just stunning. So let me... Let me just kind of throw something out at you, and, uh, and, and it's pretty stunning. So the Bible, when it was first written, didn't have chapter numbers, okay? It didn't have verses and all that. That really didn't come into play until like the 1200s, and then it really didn't come into practice until about the 1500s when the printing press came along, et cetera, right? Now, the question would be, okay, the, the, unquestionably, the Word of God is, is God-breathed, it's inspired. When it came to the chapter numbers, was that also inspired by God? You have to make your mind up. I believe that God created a little wing on the, the uh, uh, mosquito. And uh, I don't think he, like, when it came to anything about his word, like, ah, what a little figure it out. But that's just, that's me. Uh, but it doesn't matter which way you fall on this because there's something stunning. If you believe that God was in all that or he kind of checked out when all that was going on. The book of Isaiah is often called the little Bible. Let me explain why. I've done a little chart for you. In the Bible, there are 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. That's a total of 66 books. Now, again, this is with the chapters added, you know, hundreds of years later. Or you could look at it this way, that it's roughly 40 or 60 percent Old Testament, okay, and 40 percent New Testament. I know that because I did the math, all right? So it's basically 60-40. Are you with me? Now, when you look at the book of Isaiah, it has 66 chapters. 39 of those chapters are 
uh, more judgment oriented. And so the 27 chapters, they're more comfort. Now, maybe this is just a coincidence. Even if you don't buy into the whole chapter thing, okay, well, those chapters came later. Okay, it's still 40, 60%, and 40%, okay? So then if you look then at the next slide, then the first book of the New Testament then would be the 40th book of the Bible. Are you tracking? 39 in the Old Testament, for, you turn to the, from Malachi, 39th book. You turn to Matthew, it is the 40th book, all right? So the 40th chapter of Isaiah then comes here. So watch this. When you go to the next one, the 40th chapter of Isaiah begins with the words as it's opened in the New Testament, which are the words of John, the, a voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Now, let's say you don't buy into the chapter thing. That's fine. Get out. Now, moving. No, I'm just kidding. It doesn't matter. Because watch, if even a 60%, 40%, I'm going to make a point here, other than this is super cool, right? Isaiah chapter 40, or we're coming into the book of the part of the comfort, starts with these words. Comfort, comfort my people. What I'm saying to you is this, that the details of Christ in the scripture are stunning. And many religious books of other faiths are written by one person. When a one person, when it's a one person operation, consistency is kind of easy. I've written a number of books. It's easy for me to be consistent with myself. If I were to write a book that spanned over centuries with different writers and different angles and different perspectives, try to be consistent with that, okay? This is not consistent. This is miraculous. There's a difference. So when we get to this place, what we're seeing is something amazing. So as we begin to see Isaiah the, the starting in the last half, the 40%, it starts with the exact same words of John the Baptist. Okay, if you're not impressed, because I can see that all of you are not yet, here comes more. The last, in the last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. Malachi in chapter 3, there's only five chapters. Malachi chapter 3 reads this, See, I will send my messenger. Now keep in mind, this is hundreds of years before John, that we had this encounter with Zechariah. So he says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you will seek him will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant who you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Now the last chapter of the last book of the Old Testament reads like this. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the father to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with the curse. Christ came to take away the curse. Gabriel's message in Luke chapter 1, verse 13 to Zechariah says, your, your wife, Zechariah, and Elizabeth will bear a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and give and delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or ferment a drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many people of Israel will bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn their hearts to the fathers, to their children, and to the disobedient, to the wisdom, to the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for God. That is not a coincidence. That's a miracle. So God, so the, the angel Gabriel is talking to Zechariah about something that's going to happen that's kind of already happened in God's sight that he predicted to the very detail of what even was going to be said. You cannot stop the purposes of God. They're already, that's universal language for screwed in. <laughs> they're, they're tight. You get it? We are God's workmanship. You are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he has prepared in advance so that we might walk in them. Whatever is happening to you did not escape the eyes of Christ. 
Whatever has happened to you is already part of big, God's bigger plan. Maybe not the plan for you. It's not about my stupid roof. It's about what God wants to do and the connections that he wants to make and advance the kingdom. We get our eyes off this and we put them upright and all of a sudden we begin to see miracles. And finally, when he opened his mouth, we close with these words. Zechariah, who had been silenced for nine months, speaks to his own baby boy, John, and says, and you, my child, will be called a great pro- a prophet of the Most High, and you will go on before the Lord to prepare a way for him. Here comes heaven. See, the Christmas story teaches us that God is in control in 2022. We can't lose sight. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for the stunning miracles of the word of God. Thank you, Father, that as life tends to miniaturize great things and make us put gravity on our life to look down, you are looking for up right men and women. You're looking for those that look up in the right way. Every single human being, whether they're sitting in this room or they're sitting at home or listening in their car or at work or wherever they might be, every single one of us, God, has times where we need discipline. And we're thankful, God, that we have a customized relationship with you if we have exchanged our old life for Christ's new one. We pray, God, during difficult times that we'll never forget your promises are bigger than whatever response we've given. You cannot be unfaithful. You just can't. Somebody needs to hear that, God, today. Somebody in this room or at home needs to hear that your grace is bigger than our failure, than our biggest, greatest, worst failure. That your grace is bigger. Someone needs at home or here today to know that when Christ died, it wasn't just a historical thing of the past. That Christ forgives. That Christ loves. And that goes east and west, north and south, past and present and future. That whatever failure we will commit, whatever failure we have committed, whatever sin, Christ can cover it all. And grace. Someone, God needs to hear that today. And whatever is happening, God, in our lives, Your purposes are bigger than everything. Someone needs to hear that today. We bow our knee, God, to you in absolute wonder. Thank you, Father, that nothing skips your attention. Nothing is is wasted. No human life is wasted. No human life is left unpursued. So as we close this time of prayer, we think of those who are trying to figure this whole thing out. And it's a big thing to figure out that relationship with you, God. Sometimes we think it's going to a church or a synagogue or a mosque. Sometimes we think it's trying to be as good as our neighbor looks or trying to obey the golden rule and be nicer and try to, to, to change habits and behaviors. And the problem, God, is it just keeps making it worse because we're humans. And then we hear the good news. The Christ came even when we were at our worst failure. God demonstrates his love for us and 
that Christ died for us he is, even when we were sinners. As we're praying, I just wonder if that just resonates in your heart in a surprising way. That if your inner self just perked up and said, man, I wish that were true. Listen, it is true. God cannot be unfaithful. Have you ever exchanged your old life for Christ's new one? I'm not talking about trying to be better, trying to get your act together, trying to come to church more often. I'm saying between you and God right now. You're sitting in this room, you're sitting at home, sitting in your car, you're walking on a trail with earbuds in. Right now, let me ask you. Have you exchanged your old life for Christ's new one? Have you come to him and say, God, I'm broken. I'm, I'm imperfect. I cannot do enough to win your favor, your grace, your love. I can't do it, God. To be, quote unquote, spiritual enough to be right with you. So now I surrender all that stuff that can be trusted in. I surrender that, God, right now. I want to depend on Christ. Is that your prayer? You see, Jesus came as the perfect Lamb of God. He died on the cross that whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Why not say to Christ right now, wherever you are, Jesus, I trust in you. I put my faith, my allegiance in you. I'm not going to trust anything or anyone else for my right relationship with God. And I want to be okay with God. I want to be right with God. Listen, Jesus died. He'll cover your sin. He'll forgive your sin. And you stand before God because of what Christ did as if you've never sinned. He's asking you to turn your life 180 degrees around and just fall on him and exchange your old life. You've led your life long enough. You've led your life long enough. It's time to give your heart to Christ alone. Oh, we'll speak to him right now. You, your words, his heart. Your words, his heart. God, forgive me for all my sin. I, I give you my life. I turn it in in exchange for your new one. God, here I am, a sinner in need of your love. I put my faith in Christ. You speak to him. Exchange your old life for Christ's new one. I want to be a child of God. I'm asking your new life ignite in me. God, something new so grateful, God, for gathering together. It's important. We, we sense the importance of it. So we thank you for this morning, for what you're doing, for what you're speaking to us about uniquely, customized. We love you back, God. You are our hope. Here comes heaven. You give us that hope. In Jesus' name, amen.